This week in the Theater of Screams, hear a murderous plot with a vanishing corpse in The Haunting Hour. Vincent Price stars as a lighthouse keeper overrun with large rats in suspense. Inherit an old mansion with an eerie secret in Fear on Four. And learn how a doll can become a deadly force of the supernatural in the weird circle. Join us for all the frightening fun. Welcome to the Theater of Screams. Home of the most chilling radio thrillers from yesteryear and beyond. Turn the lights down low and come along with us if your nerves are strong enough. In the Theater of Screams. Stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour. <laughs> A corpse there was. Will you listen to me? I I've got to tell it to someone, and, well, I guess you've heard a lot of strange stories. I'm Catherine Holland. It all started about a year after I'd come to work for Martin Reed and Stephen Corey as the housekeeper. Oh, we'd have such fun, the three of us. And Martin was forever making me promise that I'd be with them always. Always. I didn't know how long that could be. <laughs> you're, you're only joking, huh, Kathy? You wouldn't leave us. You'll stay with us always, won't you? Not if you keep doing that, Martin. Oh, oh, you'll get used to it, Kathy. Oh, but cutting your own name on a tombstone, it's, it's positively morbid. I don't see that. If a cobbler can make his own shoes, then surely a stonecutter can make his own monument. Well, that's true. After all, a man must do something with his spare time. And you, Stephen, of all people, have no right to scoff at me. Imagine a cemetery caretaker who wanders through the graveyard day and night, talking to the dead. If the people I met outside the cemetery, my dear Martin, were as interesting as the people I meet inside, perhaps I wouldn't. Since there are only neighbors along this godforsaken road, and since I must get away from you occasionally... Now look here, enough is enough. <laughs> are we going to let her boss us around, Martin? You nearly 60 and me twice her age? That's right. And you're 42, aren't you, Stephen? Yep. You know, I think for your next birthday, I'll start on a nice marble headstone for you. Okay, I quit. I resign. Oh, no, no, don't say that, Kathy. We need you, Stephen and I. Always before, our housekeepers were stout and rheumatic. You're so young. It was like all at once having the shades pulled up and the windows opened when you came. You won't leave us, will you, Kathy? 
No, I won't leave you, Martin. You promise? I do. If you promise to take your medicine. No. No, I told you, Kathy. I don't believe in that quack doctor. There's nothing wrong with my heart. Oh, Martin, don't be stubborn. It's not a matter of being stubborn. I know I'm perfectly all right. How about those attacks you've had? They were indigestion. You don't want to take that medicine because you and the doc have been enemies for years. You won't give him the satisfaction of treating you, even if it means... Please, Kathy. Don't you think I'm old enough to know my own mind? But Kathy's right, Martin. You should take your medicine. Oh, now you start. I'm going for a walk. I'll go with you. I don't want company. Now he's mad. Oh, don't take it to heart. He'll get over it. I wish he hadn't gone out in this weather. Yeah. I think it's getting worse. I'll go call him back. Stephen, what's that noise? I don't know. It was just outside the house. It's our cedar tree. That last flash of lightning struck it. There seems to be... Kathy! What? Move away from the door so I can see two No, Kathy, please. Stay in here a minute. I'll go out. Oh, I'll go with you. I... I think I... I think I see something beside the cedar. Come on, Kathy. Stephen, it can't be. Yes, Kathy. It's Martin. He's dead. The tree? It didn't touch him. He died from the shock of it falling so close. It was hot for Strange, isn't it? The last tombstone he ever carved was his own. We buried Martin the next evening. There weren't many mourners. We lived too far from town to be well acquainted. At last, the few who'd come went away and left Stephen and me alone at the grave. They've all gone. Your eyes are all red, Kathy. Do you suppose he likes where we buried him? Right across the road from the house? I'm sure he does. He can sort of watch us from here if he gets lonely. It won't be us much longer, Stephen. What do you mean? Well, I I can't stay here with just you. It isn't proper. Kathy, you know I wouldn't... Oh, I know, but what'll people think? I don't care about people. They're not important. Well, they are to me. I have a good reputation, Stephen, and I don't Kathy, intend... Kathy, don't leave me. Oh, but I must. Losing Martin was unbearable, but if I lost you, I'd have nothing left. I'm sorry, Stephen, There'd be but... no one to care if I live or die. If you go, I'll be all alone. You'll find another housekeeper. Housekeeper? Oh, Kathy, dearest, don't be such a little fool. I'm not a fool. You are if you can't see how much I love you. You love me? Oh, no. How could I help it? You're sweet and fresh and lovely. And I never knew before what joy it was to... to watch a woman. Anything you do, the way you walk and laugh, even the way you get angry. It's beautiful. Oh, keep away from me. I don't know what's come over you. I was content just having you about the house, being near you. But now... Oh, my darling, you mustn't go away. Oh, please don't look at me like that. Please, Stephen. Dearest, let's get married. I'll make you happy. No, I... I don't love you. Don't touch me. Oh, I... I like you a lot. I'm very fond of you, but... Well, it's, it's not love. I could never love you. Why, Kathy? I'll make you a good husband. Oh, no, Stephen, no. You, you're twice my age. But I'd worship you, Kathy, dearest. Oh, to quit bawling Kathy, dearest, at me like a lost lamb. <laughs> I'm going to the house and pack my things. I won't let you go. You belong to me. I don't belong to anyone. If you don't get out of my way, I'll throw this rock at you. There's someone else. You love someone else. No, no, Stephen. I just don't love you. Don't come near me. I'll throw it. I swear. Kathy, no! I told you I would, didn't I? Why couldn't you believe me? Well, get up. Stephen. He was lying on his back, motionless. I bent over him and... His face, the rocket caught him between the eyes. I couldn't think. I, I, I was terrified. I only knew that Stephen was dead. That I had killed him. A murderess, that's what everybody would say. They'd put me on trial, all those faces gaping at me like I wasn't human. And then they'd... No. Had to get out of here. The road passed the graveyard. If I followed it, I'd reach the main highway. I'd run. I'd run so fast, no one would catch me. Oh, it was dark. The body wouldn't be found till morning. By then, I'd be far away. Had to keep moving. Had to. 
Where could I go? Where could I hide? Flying down the road for hours and hours till my legs were numb and my heart tearing and my chest deafening me with its thunder. No, that wasn't my heart. It was a car. They were looking for me. Somehow they'd found Stephen already. Oh, it was getting nearer and nearer. I slipped behind a tree. <laughs> police at all. I... Picnickers. Oh, the only ones who might have seen me. They'll forget they even passed this way once they're safe at home. <laughs> safe at home. Suddenly I realized what a fool I'd been. I couldn't escape a police dragnet by running away. They'd never stop looking for me. The best place to hide was at home. Why, of course. I'd gone back to the house from the funeral and straight to bed. Stephen had decided to stay at the grave a while longer. Everyone in town knew he liked to wander through the cemetery. And especially tonight, with Martin just buried. He... he must have caught a prowler. And the man had thrown a rock at him. That's how it happened. <laughs> I felt perfectly calm. I turned around and started back. The sky had been cloudy all evening, but as I walked up the road toward home, it cleared. I remember how lovely the moonlight looked, spilling down the steps of the house. I started to climb them. Suddenly, I... I had an impelling desire to see Stephen's body. Oh, I tried to fight it, but the thought of him, cold and crumpled, lying like some cast-off doll in an attic, hypnotized me. I went down the stairs and started across the road. He had been lying at the foot of Martin's grave, I remembered. From where I was, I couldn't make out the body. Well, that wasn't right. The old man was buried directly across from the house. I should be able to see Stephen. I slipped through the gate. Hurried to where the corpse had lain. It was gone. There wasn't a trace of it. I dropped to my hands and knees, searching about the new mound of earth for some proof that it hadn't all been a nightmare, that I'd really killed Stephen. There wasn't anything. No matted grass where the blood should have dried. Nothing fallen from his pockets. Not even the stone with which I'd struck him. And it was so quiet. So deathly quiet. With the moon whitewashing Martin's headstone... And the one next to it... The one next to it? But there hadn't been any grave there before. And this one was fresh. As fresh as Martin's. I slowly raised my eyes and looked at the tombstone. Stephen Corey, born May 9th, 1901. Died April 20th. 1944. Why, I'd... I'd know that carving anywhere. Martin was dead. But Martin had made that gravestone. Kathy stands in the moonlight, staring at the grave plaque of Stephen Corey, a plaque identical with the one Martin had made for himself before he died. And yet, how could Martin have carved that headstone? He had not made one for Stephen before he died. I knew that. Still, Stephen had been buried, and the date on the monument was right. 
I felt the answer, but I pushed it back away from my mind. It couldn't be true that Martin had kept his promise even now and had carved the stone. And that these dead who were Stephen's friends had buried him. Had he loved me so, he wouldn't make me pay for what I'd done. Did he plead with them to cover him so I'd not be found out? I didn't know. I was paralyzed with fright. I had to get out of here back to the house before I lost my sanity. I don't know how long I lay there, cowering in my bed. At last, the darkness of the night closed in about me, and I slept. But then, out of the darkness... The doorbell rang. Sharp sound, a streak of fear over my flesh. The police had come. Stephen's grave had been discovered. I had to go to the door. Are you Catherine Holland? I'm Estelle Bailey, Martin's sister. Oh, yes, I should have known. Uh, Come in, Mrs. Bailey. Stephen sent me a telegram this afternoon about Martin's death, and I took the first train out here. I'm sorry if I woke you. Oh, that's quite all right. Come in. I know it's been a long trip. Perhaps I can fix you a bite to eat? No, thank you. I'd like you to take me to see the grave right away. Martin's grave? Now? Miss Holland, I hadn't seen Martin for nine years. I'm ashamed of that, and I want to rectify it now as soon as I can. If you won't take me, perhaps Mr. Cory will. Oh, he's not here. He's in town. Well, I'll wait up till he comes in. Oh, you'll wait a long time. I don't understand. Oh, uh, Stephen was quite shocked by your brother's death, you know, and, well, he felt he had to get away from this house, so, well, he mightn't be back tonight. But if he went into town, why didn't he meet me at the station as he wrote he would? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Every moment she sat there, she'd think more and more about Stephen's absence. I had to distract her the only way I could. I had to take the chance that she wouldn't notice that other headstone. But if she did notice it, I would have to kill her too. But just then, something happened to spare us both. Oh, good heavens. Oh, look, it's raining again. Yes, the moon's gone in. It's pitch black outside. Then there's no use going into the cemetery, I suppose. I'm afraid not, Mrs. Bailey. What a shame. Finally, she went upstairs. I waited until I knew she slept. Then I took a spade and crept across to the cemetery. It was wet and cold, but I didn't notice the weather. <laughs> For I had a scheme. (laughs) A very clever scheme. I was going to dig up someone else's headstone as well as Stephen's and switch the two. I couldn't disguise his new-made grave, but at least I'd conceal who was buried there. It was just before dawn when I slipped back to the house. Mrs. Bailey woke me about eight, and together we went to the cemetery. I came up level with the graves and... Oh, no. No, it couldn't be. I had switched them last night. Stephen Corey, born May 9th, 1901. Died April 20th, 1944. His headstone. Exactly where it had been before. But I had dug it up. There were blisters on my hands to prove it. Mrs. Bailey, had she noticed? No. She'd gone right to her brother's grave and stood staring at it, wiping away the tears. I'm very glad of one thing, Miss Holland, that Martin is buried a little apart from everyone else. He liked to be alone most of the time, you know. Even in death, he would prefer solitude and being isolated from all the others. Solitude? Isolated from all the others. But Stephen was lying right by his side. She couldn't see Stephen's headstone. It was incredible. But it was true. Come, Miss Holland, it's raining. We might as well go now. I'll take the early train back to the city. After she'd gone, the house was empty, yet full of a screaming silence. And I sat looking out at the grayness of the lonesome day. Had there really been a grave at all? Growing inside me was a grim fascination to see. The mud sucked at my shoes. Through the dusk, I walked determinedly toward that spot where the headstone stood. 
I slipped through the fence. Then I was standing beside the tree, leaning against it. For I couldn't believe what I saw. There, beside the others, stood a third headstone. And stretching almost at my feet, a freshly dug grave. Even before I crept forward to see, I knew what the plaque would say. Catherine Holland, born June 7th, 1923, dead April 21st, 1945. Tonight, April 21st, that was tonight, and I was still alive. Martin, listen to me wherever you are. I said I'd be with you always, but you can't force me to follow you. You can't force me to follow you. Tears filled my eyes. I took hold of the hateful stone and tried to flatten it into the ground. Tried to... And through the tears, I, I saw the dark bruises on my hands. Bruises on my hands, but well, it wasn't possible that... I touched one of the dark splotches. It rubbed away. Then the truth went through my mind. I fell to my knees. The letters. The letters I thought were carved into the stone. They too were blurred. I drew my finger along my name. It was lettered in black crayon. Thick archaic lettering. Darker toward the middle than at the edges. Giving the illusion of depth. Giving the illusion of being cut into the stone. Then that's how Stephen's headstone was made. That's how I stood up. Fear fell over me like a cold, wet sheet. Behind this adventure was a human being. A being like myself. Then I saw the thing in the grass. Sending a tiny sparkle toward the dust-filled sky. And greedily I picked it up. A copper-colored metal cap from an eyebrow pencil. So that was how the letters had been drawn. That was how this thing had happened. Then I knew who had done it. And even before I turned to look, I knew she was standing there, staring at me, unmoving, a thin smile on her lips, her eyebrows thin too, penciled on with surety and deafness. Turn around, Miss Holland. I see you have guessed the truth. It was you. You killed him. But do you think my conscience will hurt me as yours does? Would it make your death any easier to know you didn't kill Stephen Corey? I don't understand you. I'm telling you the truth. I came into the cemetery just as the last visitor left, and I saw you throw the rock at Corey. I saw you run for the road. You hadn't killed him, Miss Holland. He was only unconscious. But I made sure he was dead before I buried him. Then you dug the grave here. That spade in your hand. Will serve a double purpose. I shall kill you with it. Just as you murdered Corey. Why? Why did you kill him? Because Martin had willed all the family property to Corey. With the provision that when he died, it would return to me. I knew if his body weren't discovered, they'd think you and he had run away together. Then I'd have to wait for him to be declared legally dead. And so you put up the plaque. I felt sure I could persuade the county coroner to file a death certificate quietly. Then I'd show my lawyer the grave, show him that Corey, too, was dead. But you came back, so I have to kill you, too. Now you know the truth. Your time has come. That spade, Mrs. Bailey. It's for you, Miss Holland. Stay back from me. Stay back. I'm going to kill you. I'm not afraid, Mrs. Bailey. You're real. I can fight you. This will be your grave, and I shall bury you in it. Give me that spade. Give it to me. Go oh, here. I said that. Give me that spade. Mrs. Bailey. My eyes were crowded with flashes of blackness. I lay on the ground, feeling the cold, wet earth against my cheek. Without warning, it had happened. One wall of the grave gave way. And she lost her balance and fell forward into the gaping hole. Dirt from the mound began rolling down, clods of it, covering the edges of her long skirt. And she lay still, silenced. At the bottom of the grave, a few wet clods of earth were still slowly tumbling down, as if they had an intelligence of their own, an intelligence that told them to bury the dead, 
bury the dead. For she was dead, and she had died instantly. Her neck twisted beneath her loosened, flowing hair that hid the hideous sight of her eyebrows, thin and long. Her neck was broken, and she lay in the grave she had meant for me. Perhaps, now I've told it, I can forget the horror of what's happened. But not soon. Not soon. One way Martin was right. In my brain, he and Stephen will be with me always. Shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. Outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. You are about to experience one of the most terrifying half hours in your entire life. Three Skeleton Key, starring Vincent Price. Oh yes, I realize superlatives tend to lose their significance by overuse. How many times have you been promised that a story would be the funniest, or the most dramatic, or the most exciting only to find that it failed to live up to its advertising. The story you are about to hear is an exception. It is unconditionally guaranteed to chill your blood unless you happen to love rats. We begin now with Mr. Vincent Price in Three Skeleton Key, a play well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. this place. A gray tapering cylinder welded by iron rods and concrete to the key itself. A bare black rock 150 feet long, maybe 40 wide. That's at low tide. At high tide, just the light rising 110 feet straight up out of the ocean. And all about it, the churning water, gray-green, scum-dappled, warm as soup and swarming with gigantic bat-like devilfish, great violet schools of Portuguese man-o'-war, and, yes, sharks, the big ones, the 15-footers. And as if this wasn't enough, there was a hot, dank, rotten-smelling wind that came at us day and night off the jungle swamps of the mainland. A wind that smelled like death. Set in the base of the light was a watertight bronze door. And in you went and up. Yes, up and up and round and round. Past the tanks of oil and the coils of rope. 
cases of wicks, racks of lanterns, sacks of spuds and cartons and cans, and up, and up, and up, round and round. Over the light storeroom was the food storeroom, and over the food storeroom was the bunk room where the three of us slept. And over the bunk room was the living and cooking room. And over the living and cooking room was the light. She was a beauty, balanced like a ballerina on the glistening steel axle of her rotary mechanism. And at night you'd lie there on the stone deck of the gallery with her revolving smoothly and quietly over your head, easing her bright white eye 360 degrees around the horizon. You'd lie there watching to see that the feeders kept working, that everything ran right. <laughs> and it wouldn't be bad. The other two fellows snoring in their sacks two levels down. <laughs> you'd smoke your pipe to kill the stink of the wind it wouldn't be bad. About those other two, Louis and August, what a pair. Louis, he was head man, was a big fellow from the Basque country, black beard, little hard black eyes, and a pair of arms that I tell you, those arms were as big around as my legs, yeah? <laughs> Head man he was, and what word he let go was law. A silent fellow, and although I spent my first two weeks trying to strike up a real conversation, the most I could ever get uh, out of him was... I took up this profession because I, I, I don't like people. They talk too much. It's quiet work, light tending. Let's keep it that way. Understand? You, you're getting to be as bad as August. I thought maybe... That was well, Louis. Me... And when he accused me of becoming like August, I quieted down because August was the talkingest man I've ever met. The talkingest and the ugliest. He was hunchbacked, stood four feet high, had red hair and big blue eyes. It seems he'd been an actor in Paris. Played in over 200 different productions, dear boy. That's a grand guignol. Oh, but it was monstrous. Horrible. In the way we used to scare the audience. <laughs> I, I was hated. Yes, yes. They used to throw things and hiss and, and bare their teeth at me. Well, finally, it got too bad. I, I couldn't stand it any longer. No, I gave up the theater. My nerves, you understand. Yes, I gave it up completely. I really did. I couldn't any longer. It all started one morning at 2.30. I was on watch, lying on the cool stone deck, pulling on my pipe, staring out at the blackness, the phosphorescent comers, and the big yellow stars... When out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something show up for a second. Something the light had touched, far off. I waited for her to come around again, and when she did, there it was. A three-master, a big one, about a half mile off, and coming down out of the nor-nor-west, coming straight for us. You, know, you must understand, our light was where it was for a very good reason dangerous submerged reefs surrounded us and ships kept clear but this one this sailing vessel was coming straight on i went over to the gallery door and yelled louis louis what ship headed for the reefs coming right up i had the glasses out now couldn't read her name, but I could see her quite plainly. All sails set, the foam creaming away under her bow, her beautiful lines. A Dutch ship, I guessed it. But why didn't she turn? Every time it passed, our light hit her with the glare of day. Ship? Where? No, no, west. The light will touch her in a moment. Can't they see? Look at her. She just keeps coming on. The square heads. What is it? What? Watch no no west. I know. I know what it is. What? 
The Dutchman. The Flying Dutchman. She's derelict. That's it. Derelict? Abandoned. The crew left her for some reason or other, but instead of sinking, she's gone on, running before every wind. She'll not run long. Not with these reefs to break her up. A beautiful ship. Now, why would men leave a beautiful ship like that? We watched her the rest of those black hours, healing and rocking, pushed and pulled by every stray wind, every freak current. Watched her until the dawn came, till the sea turned from black to a pearly gray. And on she came again, heading for us. We all had our glasses trained on her now. August, you can kill the light. Right, Chief. She doesn't look so good by daylight. Do you think she'll ground this time? I say, do you think she'll ground this time? This is impossible. Absolutely impossible. Why? Here, take my glasses. They're stronger than yours. All right. What is it? I had to focus and then... My breath froze in my throat. The decks were swarming with a dark brown carpet that looked like a gigantic fungus, but undulating. And on the masts and yards, the guys and all, were hundreds, no, thousands, no, I don't know, an inestimable number of tremendous rats. See them? Yes, yes, I see them. Now we know why she's a derelict. Yes, now we know. What are you two doing here? Give me a look. Yeah, yes, give him the glasses. Uh, Take a good look, Chatterbox. Huh? Give you something to talk about. She's still heading for us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look, if she's going to turn, she'd better turn soon. Suppose she doesn't. You mean suppose she piles up on the key? It's low tide. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. Well, where's all the conversation? Oogies? No! Huh? No! She's still coming on. Go away! Turn. Go away! Turn, will you turn? I say, I pray you turn. Cracked up. <laughs> Rats, look! On the water, like a carpet. Swimming. Sure, they're swimming. Those are ship rats. They're swimming for the rocks. The door below, it's open. Yes, come on. How he went, racing down the stone stairs, taking them three and four at a time. Scared. You can bet we were scared. Oh, you get the windows. Maybe they can climb. We don't know. Right, Chief, but hurry. Hurry. See them? No. Oh, yeah. oh, yes, I do, yes. Up at the other end of the rock. Look at them. Me! They smell us. Here they come. Close the door. I can't. It's stuck. Oh, here, let me... You move me. You move. You made it. Holy. That was close. One got in. Look, there. We'll get him. Watch it. He's... Kick him. Oh, what a brute. It's as big as a tomcat. Bigger. His eyes were wild and red, his teeth long and sharp and yellow. He went for a starving, ravenous. And we fought him, fought that one rat all over the room. It was all, believe me, I do not exaggerate. It was like fighting a panther. Got him. We'd better get aloft. We ran up the winding staircase. We passed the tiny windows of the various levels. And at every one, every one was a thick, wriggling, screaming curtain of brown fur. I was ahead of Louis, and I dreaded each successive level. Suppose they had found a way in. Oh, look at them. Oh, will you look at them? It's a nightmare. Will you look at them? The air of the gallery was thick and fetid with the stink of them. The light was dim brown, filtered through the crawling mass that swarmed over the glass all about us. We could not see the sky, nothing, nothing but them. 
Their red eyes, their claws, their wriggling, hairy snouts, and their teeth. The rats, they screamed and howled and threw themselves against the glass. They were starving, and we three, we stood quietly, very, very quietly, in the center of the glass room, under our beautiful light, and we waited. What can we do? What can we do, Chief? Take it easy, Yogi. No, Take it easy. It, it won't do any good. It won't do any good to stand here and shake. That's right. Go away. Go away. Do you hear me? Go away this instant. They won't go away. Not until... Finish it, Chief. Not until what? Not until they've been fed. You can take just so much horror, and then you get used to it. And they were interesting to watch, you know. They couldn't understand the glass. <laughs> they could see us, and they could rush at us, but that thin, invisible barrier held them off, stopped them. From time to time, we caught a glimpse of the rocks below. More rats down there, swarming brown velvet in the bright tropical sunlight. And then the tide began to rise. If only it had drowned some of them. Ship rats don't drown. You can't drown one of them. Look, they're all climbing up the tower. Yeah, this bunch around us is getting thicker. <laughs> Say, what's the time, huh? <laughs> Quarter of six. You've got first watch. Yes, Wake that's right. Ten. I will, I will. Come along, August. It was getting dark. One side of the room was lit a soft, filtered red. Sun set through the rats. Oh, very pretty. <laughs> I set the wicks, checked my fuel, and then lit the lamp. It caught them. Lit them in their gigantic, wriggling web of pale, hairless bellies, twitching red tails, bright eyes. And then I started the rotary motor. The light drove them mad. As she swung slowly and smoothly about, she blinded them in the fierce stabbing bar of light moving continually about, ever turning, ever touching, ever moving around and around, and they twitching and shuddering, eyes flaming when they were struck by the light, the bright light moving and behind on the dark side of the room, so close, so close... I dared not turn my back, which cannot help turning your back when you are in a room made of glass. On the dark side of the room, you could not see them, but only their eyes, thousands of points of blank red light, blinking and twinkling like the stars of hell. Louis relieved me at ten. But as you may imagine, I didn't get much sleep that night. When I came up into the gallery early the next morning, there stood August. He was bowing to the rats, waving his arms, and so help me, making morning, a speech. My dear audience, I am going to play once again that magnificent role which made me the toast of the Paris theater. Prelati, the evil genius of the medieval underworld. <laughs> I am he who did guide the dark soul of the Marachal into the nether paths. <laughs> Do not be frightened, little children. I will not hurt you much. <laughs> he kept Come turning. I stood staring at him. Horror struck, but he didn't notice me. The man had gone mad. He kept turning, telling his stories to all the rats, leaving not one out. August! August! Another one, a latecomer. Take a seat on the aisle, dear Patrick. Oh, oh, stop it, stop it! He didn't stop. He went on bowing and scraping to the rats, his big blue eyes rolling and winking, his wild red hair waving about him. I grabbed him by the arm and slapped his face. 
He looked at me like a child, and then his face screwed up. He looked as though we were about to cry. Go below, August. Go on. Oh, very well, then. <laughs> Later, my dear audience. Later. <laughs> Matinee today. <laughs> Sure, he was crazy. But I guess we all were. A few hours later, he came back up and caught Louie and me teasing the rats. Yes, <laughs> sounds horrible. <laughs> it, it was fun. We would get right up against the glass and make faces at them. It drove them crazy. They would scratch away, trying to get at our eyes. <laughs> Louis was even cuter about it. He'd pull a piece of bread out of his pocket and press it against the glass. The rats would scramble into a solid ball, fighting each other, clustering like, like grapes. From time to time, a whole knot of them would slip and fall 110 feet to the surf below. Look! Look, look at the sharks. <laughs> They're eating them. No, those sharks are our friends. <laughs> here, here. Mm. I I'll get another bunch together. <laughs> here, my beauty. That's it. I'll um, kill each other. <laughs> there they go. <laughs> August joined in, too. Oh, 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 very ingenious, August. He learned that if he spread-eagled himself against the glass, they'd bunch and bundle against his figure. Then he'd leap back. Look! My portrait in rats! <laughs> it went on all day, and then I was lying in bed. It was about midnight. I was very tired, and I was just beginning to fall off to sleep when I became conscious of a new sound. I couldn't figure it at first. I got up, lit the lamp, and went to the window. Even as I looked at it, I saw one of the panes begin to sag in. They had eaten the wood away. Louis, Louis, come quick. What? What, what they, is it? They found a way in. I held the glass with my hand. Now they were all going crazy, and assured of the success of this maneuver, they were all nibbling away at the wood. Louis ran below and then returned with a large sheet of tin. We spread it against the window and hammered it into place. Even as we did so, I, I felt the heavy bodies thudding against the other side as the window gave way. Uh, that ought to hold her. If it doesn't, we're done for. Rats can't eat tin. No, no, they can't. What? What was that? I don't know. It came from below. The storeroom window. They're in. They're swarming up the stairs. Drop the trap. Like... Two of them got in. We'll go after them. We didn't have to go after them. They came at us. I leapt to one side and grabbed a marlin spike, swung and smashed one in midair. I whirled to see Louis with the other. It had ripped his hand open and the blood was pouring all over the place. He held his hand aloft and kicked at the snarling rat. I stepped and swung and got him. Oh, my hand. He's got my hand. That's the both of them, Louis. I'll oh, get you something blood. to tie that up. Blood, look at it, my blood. I'm, I'm bleeding. Don't worry about it, Louis. Don't worry. Now, here, look. I'll wind yeah. this kerchief around it. It'll be okay. Blood. Oh. There, there, there. Blood. There, there, there. It's not bad, just the flesh. My blood. Then I became conscious of a new sound. They were gnawing their way through the wooden trap door. I watched the planks fascinated, and even as I did, it began to give way. A bristling, whiskery snout showed through. Louis! Louis, we've got to go up! The next level was the living quarters and kitchen. I slammed the trap there, too, but it, too, was wood. Oh, my blood. What, what are we going to I, do? I don't know. They'll be through this one in a moment. The gallery. The trap door in the gallery is metal. Good. Come on. <laughs> Oh, we made it. We made it. We lay across.
lost the trap, exhausted, while below us the rats took over the entire tower. We could hear them howling and fighting over our food supply, our water, our leather, and all about us the others screamed and glared in at us, swayed in a tangled mess, hypnotized by the ever-turning light. By morning, the air in the little room was horrible. To now, we'd been getting air from the tower below. Now that was sealed off. And so was all our food and water. We lay exhausted and panting, waiting, waiting. And the hours crawled on. I, I was almost dozing from fatigue when I saw a sight that brought me too fast. <laughs> Would you like to come in, my beauty? Yes, uh, will you? <laughs> I hold the powers of life and death, and I can let you in, you know. Yes. Auguste was standing by the glass, and in one hand he held a big wrench. He was tapping the glass gently, not quite hard enough to break it. I eased myself to my feet and slowly, very slowly, I tiptoed toward him. All I have to do is just a little harder and... I found a coil of wire in the tool kit and I trussed him up, fastened him to a stanchion in the center of the room. Louis was of no help. He lay on his side looking at his bloody hand, weak and sick as a baby. So there I was, a lunatic and a coward for company, and all about watching our little drama, The Rats. The day dragged by. The supply boat wasn't due for another 12 days. I don't know what they could have done if they had come. And we had only one way of summoning them. That was to shoot off distress rockets, but the rockets were four floors below. And even if they'd been right there in the gallery, I, I couldn't have opened a window to fire them. That night, I tended the light but its flame was devouring our oxygen. The following day, we lay, thirst-tormented, starving, waiting, waiting. The following night, I again tended the light, but the small supply of spare wicking we kept in the gallery had become exhausted, and quite suddenly, at about midnight, the light went out. <laughs> There was nothing I could do. Wicks were stored three levels below. Nothing I could do, nothing. From time to time, I'd strike a match to see the clock. And when I did, it lit up the million red eyes about us. All about us, watching, waiting. Below, it had grown quiet. They'd cleaned us out, and now they, too, were waiting. Oh, waiting. And then the rats, quite suddenly, were silent. And then I heard it. And then I saw the sky and the stars. The rats were gone. I went to the glass. Out there on the water, a small freighter, a banana boat showing a few lights, came softly and innocently at us. The light was out. They didn't know. I, I wanted to open the windows to call out to them, to warn them somehow, but, but I was afraid. What if the rats were hiding from me, tricking me? So I waited. She grounded very softly on a reef not 200 yards from the quay. Grounded so gently that the man playing the cornet, was he a passenger, a crewman off watch, didn't even stop playing. 
they tried washing her back off. I could have told them to save their fuel. The tide was rising, would have floated her free. And I waited. Well, that's all. That's the story. The sun came up and there wasn't a rat on the whole key. Every last one of that terrible army had deserted us. Gone back to sea on their new ship. August? Insane asylum, he never recovered. Louis, they took him into Cayenne where he died of blood poisoning from his bite. Life on three skeleton key isn't bad these days. <laughs> But sometimes, when I see a strange vessel approaching, I get a little nervous. Sure. Somewhere on the seas, there's a little banana boat without a crew. That is, without a human crew. <laughs> Suspense, in which Vincent Price starred in Three Skeleton Key with John Daner and Ben Wright. Suspense. Suspense was directed in Hollywood by William N. Robeson. Three Skeleton Key was adapted by James Poe from the story by George G. Todos. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the original score. Sound pattern by Cliff Thorsness, Gus Bays, and Ray Kemper. George Walsh speaking. Suspense is presented by the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, as this week we reach number nine in my series of twelve tales of terror. Once more, too, I have delved into the science of numerology to find that the number nine is associated with the making of spells. So, what could be more apt than to find that our story today takes us to that land of mystery and spells, Wales? I've always suspected that Wales is a magic land, where the abnormal is an everyday affair. <laughs> I suspect, too, that most of us have harbored a secret dream of a sudden windfall, a win on the pools, or perhaps the death of a distant, and hopefully not too loved, relative. This windfall came suddenly to David and Helen Hollis. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to mind well the tree. You're quite sure I can't press you to another glass of sherry? No, thank you. Oh. Uh, Mrs. Hollis, then. Oh. <clears throat> well, now... Mr. Wainscott, hmm? it's been a long and tiring journey, if we could get to the matter in hand. Oh, yes, I, I quite understand. But to business, then. <clears throat> the state of the late Miss Hester Amelia Parget. 
To my nephew, David Hollis, I do bequeath the residue of my estate, both realty and personality, the latter to include my home, which he has in fact named, Elm Tree Cottage in the county of Monmouth. <clears throat> and these are her own words, I would stress. To be his and his heirs in perpetuity. <clears throat> At a rough estimation, the estate should amount to something over... Eighty thousand pounds. Darling! Mm, quite. There is, however, one small proviso to the bequest. A kind of uh, codicil, in a manner of speaking, not legally witnessed and therefore not legally binding. However, here we are. It was written on the envelope that contained her will. David? Hmm? Mind well the tree. In her own hand, her very last direction, we have her doctor's word for it. But what does it mean? A wandering of the mind, or elm tree cottage. Miss Paget was a keen horticulturist. Perhaps just a final expression of, how shall I put it, tender concern? That it shouldn't be cut down? Perhaps. I can't work out why the old dear should decide to bestow all her worldly goods on me. A couple of hundred quid. The old painting to remember her by, perhaps, but... Her only living relative. So? But you used to visit her. I've visited my dentist more often. Well, then she must have taken an instant shine to you. She hardly had time to make up her mind one way or the other. One of the first partnerships I worked for was with a firm in Bristol. My mother had often mentioned her, so one weekend, instead of heading for the bright lights, I ventured into darkest Wales and paid a call on Aunt Hester instead. That's all. Did you go back often? Why do you ask? Shouldn't I? No. No, I... No, I, I did go back once or twice. Oh, half a dozen times at most. Why? Why not? It simply amused me to, I suppose. Until? Until it stopped amusing me. Silly old woman. I see. By the way, uh, don't let the cottage tag deceive you. It's a damn great barn of a place. I'll have to burn a ruddy elm to stop us freezing to death. All done then, is it? Not another crumb, Mrs. Roberts. Just Gwen will be best, if that's all right with you. Of course. Gwen and Shun it shall be then. Me doing the housekeeping and my Shun, gardener, handyman. Jack of all trades, if it comes to that. Anyway, partial to my Welsh cakes, I'm glad to see. Delicious, Gwen. David? Oh, fine. Yes, fine. Fresh batch this morning, wasn't it, Sean? Oh, yeah, yes, like you say. Of course, he keeps telling me I'm wasting my time. But I had the feeling you'd be arriving today. Well, that's it, then. Um, uh, oh, uh, Sean, something to ask. What do you learn to do sing, quid, Robert? Only uh, if any luggage you want taken up. No, no, thank you. Actually, I did pack a couple of overnight cases. Did you? They're in the boot. It is open. Mindanolani instruments, Miss Esther, I went. Where else you think then? Of course, Miss Esther's room. Mrs. Roberts, is there a phone? Oh, there is, yes. Only recent, sir. Doctor insisted when Miss Esther got taken poorly. Well then. Studies first on the right. Thank you. David! There's no need to look like that. You may have packed your cases, but the world doesn't stop for Welsh cakes. Uh, just wait there a minute, Mum, and I'll draw these curtains back. Oh, there we are now. Oh, drat. I asked that shun particular to open the window. Oh, it's a beautiful room, Gwen. 
Miss Esther's. She used to sit here near the window hour after hour, especially towards the end. That gardener real love. My son always tended it like it was his very own. I'm sure my husband and I will appreciate you both just as much as Miss Hester did. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Hollis busy at the moment, is he? Mr. Hollis is always busy. Can you see the famous elm from here? Uh, the elm? Oh, come along, Gwen. Elm Cottage, remember? Well, then. Yes. Just see it, right at the bottom there. You can see it sticking out from that little spinny. Oh, I see it. But surely... It's dead, isn't it? Dead and rotten, Mum. From long before my shun and me come to work here. He was always on to Miss Esther about having the old thing cut down. Hazard as well as an I saw the way he put it. She never would hear of it. How strange. How very strange. Uh, Mum? There's no reason why I shouldn't tell you, Gwen. Miss Hester actually mentioned it in her will. The tree? From what her solicitor told us, it must have been practically her last request. She asked us to look after it, to tend it well. Anyway, we naturally assumed we'd find the thing alive and thriving. Yes, you would. Just a last-minute flight of fancy, I suppose. Well, if we've uh, finished up here... David, what on earth is going on? Nothing's going on. I just told the man to put my stuff back in the car. But I thought... Yes, well, I'm afraid I'm needed up in town. But... You thought we'd be staying over. The notion was yours, my love, not mine. Any particular reason? Well, in the very first place, it wasn't part of the arrangement, was it? Not my plan, anyway. We finished our business at the solicitors, all signed, sealed and delivered. Then I simply assumed, never having been informed to the contrary, we'd be homeward bound. But an overnight stop. I don't understand you behaving like this. Don't we discuss things any more? I'm sorry. I just got carried away. Can we discuss them now? No. I'm sorry. I must get back. Any particular reason? Business. Just business. All right. A lack of empathy with the place. That suits you? It's just as beamed and gloomy as I'd always remembered it. All chintz and horse brass and be anything else then, ma'am? They were only doing their best to make us feel welcome. I'm sure they were. And I can see the place will suit you down to the ground, away from it all, the perfect writer's retreat. Oh, I'm staying, am I? I have to get back. I assumed you wanted to stay with your overnight banks. What if I decide to come with you? Fine. Are you? No. I want to get to know the place. Right, then. When will I see you? A couple of days. I'll try and make it in a couple of days. Bye, then. Oh, that is. Oh, I was just going to bring you some lemon barley out now, Mum. Uh, you'll find it uh, just on the side there. Gwen, you didn't tell me the house had another story. Uh, story? Another floor, above the main bedroom. It doesn't, Mum. I happened to glance up in the garden just now. There's a window set high up under the eaves. Oh, that. Well, then... Is it an attic, or what? Oh, not an attic. Not one that runs the full length of the house, anyway. It's just a... Well? Just the one small, um... Uh, box room, I suppose you'd call it. Why didn't you take me out to see it when you were showing me around? I just didn't think it was worth the climb. There's nothing of interest. Well, would you show it to me now? I'd like to see all the house. Uh, now, Mum? Yes. I'd uh, rather not if it's all the same to you. Why? Why, Gwen? Well, uh, my shun doesn't like anyone going up there. Why not? Couldn't say, ma'am. He doesn't tell you? Gwen? We'll be needing the keys.
You see, Mum? Just a box room, that's all. Whose room was this, Gwen? Uh, only for somebody in service, Mum. Oh, living, you mean? Believe Miss Esther did have somebody once. And? Oh, not much I can tell. Long before I married, Sean had come to work for her. Twenty years back, maybe more. How strange. Uh, well, all those years ago, and yet everything in its place. It's still so neat and tidy. A, a feeling, almost as though she just walked out of that door and expected back any minute. Uh, Miss Esther. Yes? Just the way she liked it kept. Was this the girl's trunk, Gwen? Yes. Yes, like you say. C E I. And? Uh, Kanewen. Kanewen Davis was the name, it seems. It's tied with, um, hemp. Mm. As though she were all packed to leave. But did she leave then, Gwen? Oh, yes. She left. Gwen! Kilana! Yes? Uh, Shun. Dan was a hear mistress. You come down on one instant, do you hear me? Will I leave you then? Oh, I'll be fine. Down in a minute. Mind well the stairs. They narrow on the turning. Kynwin. What a beautiful name. Kynwin Davis. Tied. But not locked. Kynwin Davis. The needle still left in. She must have made them herself. Oh, poor things. Poor things may be, but all her own. A wedding dress. A wedding dress. Beautiful. About the neck, embroidered flowers, fine forget-me-nots, oh, beautiful, and baby clothes, a, a knitted smock, it's beautiful, forget-me-nots, and a knife, what an awful thing to leave in there, what a dreadful thing, oh, Oh, how hideous. Two, four, eight. This is two, four, eight. Uh, who? Oh, oh, yes, sir. I'll fetch her at once, sir. Thank you, Gwen. It's uh, Mr. Hollis, ma'am. Hello, David. About time. No. No, not to worry. What time can we expect you? What? You can't go... But I don't understand. The last time you rang, you definitely promised that... But it's been a week. Surely... We've all gone to so much trouble. Oh, no, I suppose not. If it can't be helped, it can't be helped. Oh, bye, David. Bye, David. Uh, change your plans, ma'am? I've um, got some work to do, Gwen. I'll, I'll be in the garden. Fine day, ma'am. Yes, I'm bringing my work into the garden. Oh, I ain't that much of a rush to have it done, then. Seeing as I've nothing else to do at the moment. Just leave you to it, then. I'll uh, get my Gwen to bring you out some tea in a bit. Thank you. That would be lovely. The servant girl. They were poor things, but all her own. Hot. Oh, oh, it's too hot. Sean, will you help me move this table? Oh, well, there's a bench around the tree. Cool 
cool here. Shady and cool. Mind well the tree. Poor dead thing. Mm -hmm. Who is it? Who's there? Is it you, Kenwin? Carved in the bark. True love hearts. Intertwined. Carve your Kenwin, true love's heart, my love. But the other name's been gouged out. This sap from a dead tree. Salt. It tastes of salt. Hey, one. You'll be all right. Perfect safe now. Oh. It was that branch, wasn't it? Oh, should have put an axe to the whole thing years ago. And all my stupid fault. When I spotted you crossing the lawn... I should have thought to... Uh... Warn me, Shun. Uh, uh, sweetie, to you to... Stay well away from the place. It would have made no difference. I'd have asked the reason, and you'd have made up some cock and bull story, or, or even told me the truth. I'd have gone anyway. To see for myself, it would have made no difference. Uh, I, I... What you tried to do when I demanded to be shown that upstairs attic bedroom, wasn't it, Gwen? Her room. Kynwin's room. Just as she might have left it, exactly. Her trunk, all packed and tied for leaving. And why should Miss Hester insist on it remaining just as she left it, untouched for so many years? Why? Uh, Sean? M Miss Carrion. Well? Uh, Sean knew Kainwin Davis, ma'am. Uh, related, ma'am. Only distant. And then, don't know it all. Nobody know it all. Cain, we're not just a living servant here, more family, far as Miss Hester concerned. Not often the girl came down into the village, happy to stay here, happy as the day. And always that old song on her lips, until... Oh, please! All her happiness stopped. Talk and rumour is all to go by, that's all. Young love... But secret love is what they said. When? And uh, to leave with him and happy ever after. A trunk already packed and final proof for that. Final? What is? No note goodbye. No reason given. Secret love, all right. Best part of the day and night before Miss Esther found her. Yeah. Hanging from that elm. Never to be felt. Her memories, manner of speaking. Always so happy. And always that old song on her lips. Mind well the tree, David. Your aunt's last words, David. Her exact last words. I'm warning you, Helen. Keep this up and weekend or not, I'm catching the next train out of here. Not tend the tree or care for the tree, but mind. It was meant as a warning. The girl did hang herself from it, David. Just the way they said she did. Which is the only sad part of the whole ridiculous business. The rest is pure Thomas Hardy. Oh, Helen, please come to bed. But the danger... ...is only in that rotten old stump. Hester must have known that. I'll have it chopped down tomorrow. Yes. Don't you care? Yes, I care. Come back to London. You don't need me there. Then stay here, then. Oh, I've had it. What a hell of a day. Do you remember her? Hmm? Kynwin, please tell me. Oh. How the hell should I? Twenty years ago? It must have been about the time you were here, visiting. Is this morbid interest? Or something more searching? I'm curious. 
If the girl was working here, she was a servant. I probably never saw her. David. Okay. If you don't believe me, at least give me the credit for being selective. <laughs> Besides, under Aunt Hester's eagle eye, there wouldn't have been a cat's chance in hell of anything happening. Satisfied. She was expecting a child. Was she? How do you know? I'm... I'm not sure. Fanciful nonsense. She was a domestic, not one of your heroines. What's that? Wind. David. Please, David. Oh, for God's sake. All right, all right. Nothing. What the hell did you expect? Must have been some damn tree. There's nothing near the house. Oh, sleep. For God's sake, get some sleep. There is only one tree. Our tree. Dove is carried. Helen? You there? What are you doing? They said I'd probably find you here. Did they? I asked what you're doing up here. It's not safe, you know. Those stairs are rotten. Peaceful. Like we've always belonged. What? Peaceful up here. You said, like we've always belonged. Did I? Yes. It's going to be hot again. You can see the tree from that window, can't you? Oh, well, never mind the tree. Will you come down? But we're alone here. Far from the bright eyes. Don't you feel it too? Helen? The two of us. No more to part. What are you talking about? Carriard. What's that you're wearing? That ring? A true love's pledge, my one. My only heart. Helen. Helen. Helen, take the ring off, please. Where did you get it from? Helen, that's not yours. Oh, but it is. No, Helen, stop oh, it. it stop it, Helen. Ah! Tis token of love that David gave his king. Yes? Yeah? Oh, Gwen. Oh, only to see what the doctor had to say, ma'am. Nothing broken. Only a badly sprained ankle. The doctor gave him some painkillers. He's drowsy now. Oh, I warned him to mind those attic stairs. Oh, he's waking. Off you go. Shun will be worried whatever's become of you. Uh, but, but you're quite sure you don't want me to stay over the night with you? It will be no trouble. Huh. As for Shun, I'm sure he could manage her. This is Robert. No, no. There's absolutely no need, and I wouldn't dream of it. I'll be with him. Don't worry. No, don't leave me with her. In the name of God, don't leave me. Night, Gwen. Night, Mum. No. Pretty find herself special. 
for him alone to see. Being back to our room for the last time, see. Poor things may be, but all my own. We shall never know if Hester intended to warn David. They found him hanging from the elm, his heart gouged out and lying at Helen's feet. She was oblivious to his blood, to the thick of flies. Had she been possessed by a ghost, or simply her own jealousy? We shall never know. Where she has gone, she speaks no word, only the song, a long dead song in Welsh. It echoes from her cell and on down the tightly locked corridor. In Mind Well the Tree, Nicola Paget played the tragic Helen and Philip Bond played David. Mefanwy Talag was Gwen, and Shun and the solicitor were played by Dilwyn Owen. The story was written by William Ingram, and directed in Wales by Adrian Morby. My name is Edward de Souza, the man in black, and I hope you will join me next week for another taste of fear on four. Speak again their immortal tale, the dog.
Quiet, quiet. I'll have the bailiff clear the court if this continues. Quiet. Now then, did the court understand the defense correctly? The defendant wishes to make a statement. Yes, Your Honor. I wish to make it regarding the death of the fortune teller, Madame Philomel of Golash Street. My name, as I have said, Your Honor, is Frederick Hippie. I am an inventor and have fashioned many strange things. In Golash Street I was and still am called the Wondersmith. And what I wish to say now is not merely a change in testimony. No, Your Honor, it is more than that. It is a confession. I am only a man who hated his stepdaughter with a burning passion. Hated her who through all her life crossed me, whose willfulness made of my days a running sore, whose very youth and strength angered my aging eyes. Yes, hated her, and to make her life suffer was my one consuming ambition. Now she is out of my reach. The young man Solon, her foolish and scrawny lover, is innocent of anything in the death of the fortune teller Philomel. I am the guilty one. I. The events began when I first saw them together. Solon and my stepdaughter Zonila. Solon had a bookstore, a hovel of a place across the street. On this afternoon he was reading to my stepdaughter Zonila, and the pleasure on her face angered me. I could hear Solon's voice from where I was, standing in front of my shop with Philomel, the fortune teller. Let me not the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love. Wondersmith, your little bud's blooming in the sun. Zonila! Zonila! Yes? Come here. Look how he shuts his book with a bang. You've a great voice for frightening, Wondersmith. Yes? Have you sat there in the sun long enough, cooing to each other like sick doves? We're not. Get in the house. Upstairs to your room and stay there. Your lover will bake alone in the sun. Get in. Wondersmith, the joy's gone out of her face. She'll laugh only when I laugh. Get in the house, Zunila. You're a fine stepfather, Wondersmith. Your daughter's lucky. <laughs> Stop it. We've business, Philomel. So we have. We made a bargain, Philomel. I have done my part of it. Have you done yours? Yes, Hippie. My magic has trapped a soul for the doll. It's in a bottle. You say your part is done? Yes. The paint is drying on the doll now. We will meet tonight at eight in my shop. Do our honored colleagues know? Kaplom the honest jeweler and Oak Smith the cutthroat? <laughs> I've told them. <laughs> and we will test the doll tonight. Yes. It will be a rare sight, Wondersmith, to see a wooden mannequin come alive full of murder and wrath. If the soul you've bottled is full of murder and wrath... Do not worry, neighbor. My pick of murderous souls is vast and deep. Gallow birds, jail birds, a whole nation of outlaws are on the waiting list. And we'll be rich... And with the riches, we'll have power. I wonder, Smith, we'll be rich, albeit somewhat bloody. Tonight, then, Philomel. Tonight. Philomel, answer it. It's after eight o'clock. It must be then. Coming. Coming. Patience, you dogs. I'm an old woman, not a young bird. So, you're here at last. Eh. Come in, Kaplom. You too, Brother Oaksmith. Is everything ready? Where's Hippie? Uh, sit, sit, friends. We will begin in a few minutes. Mm. Here's wine. Ah. Drink. Ah. I will be back in the morning. Uh, I've brought some stones, Philomel. Rubies. Uh, we'll test the doll with them. Uh, here. Good. And you, Oaksmith? The key to the bird store. Splendid. You're a fine purse snatcher, boy. Uh, is that a doll? Yes. Look. <gasps> oh, a masterpiece. Beautiful, Wondersmith. Beautiful. A magnificent little man with the face of a devil. The sword in his hand is as sharp as a razor. I have never fashioned anything as fine as this. No. And we will bring him alive with one of Philomel's souls 
and send him out into the world for victims. That we choose. Yes, <laughs> that we choose. He will bring us back the rarest jewels. And he'll fight the very devil himself to do it. An epic thief the size of a cat. Uh, let us test him now. Uh, have you the soul, Philomel? In this bottle. The soul of a scoundrel hung at dawn from a public gallows. You seem uneasy, Philomel. This is a restless and angry soul. He stirs in the bottle. Let it loose upon the doll. Soon. Soon. Uh, silence. Huh? What is it, Ebby? I heard something. This hall, the step going by. Your daughter, perhaps. Uh, she wouldn't dare. Oh, come, you're imagining things. There's no one here. I'm not so sure. Uh, we're only wasting time. The doll. It sounded like a step. Oh, shut the door. You're nervous. All right. But I was sure that... Loose the soul, Philomel. Then put the rubies away and stand behind me. The soul will leap to the first figure it sees and... Well, I am a bit uneasy about the one I've captured. Be careful. Now then, I cover the doll and push the bottle under the covering. Loose the stopper and, unerring, sure with devilish art, possess this body, seize this heart, muscle and nerve and brittle bone. Make them all your very own. Oh, it's it's moving under the covering. Pull off the wrapping. Pull it off. I'll do it. See? Oh, by the seven gods. It's, it's alive. Yes. Alive. Like uh, you and I. See how it glares at us, turning its doll's head from side to side. Oh. Look. It bears its teeth at me. The hate in its eyes when it glares at you, Philomel. Beware its sword, Philomel. Hippie, it is not a friendly doll. That's the soul you gave it, Philomel. It does not like me. Perhaps it wants the taste of blood, and I've the most of it here. The key to the bird store, Philomel. I gave it to you. So you did. Well, my bitter little foe, you shall have your taste of blood. Oh, you'd better call back that soul, Philomel, until we get to the bird shop. I think I'd better, too. Come, my friend. It's home for you. Better call back the soul. Relax the muscle. Release the bone. Give up this palace. Leave this home. A light. It's black as pitch here. Hey, wait. I have a candle. Oh. Hold the doll, Oaksmith, while I strike a match. I have the doll, Wondersmith. Just a minute. What was that? Strike the match, Help. Wondersmith. Strike Help. it. Uh, uh, there. Wait. Oh, it's, oh, it's a parrot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's a watchdog of a bird for you. <laughs> Quick. Somebody might have heard. Yes, yes. Give the doll his soul again, Philomel. Let's be done with this test. Help. Silence. Master. Silence, you feathered no. fool. To work. Cover the doll. The bottle now and... Oh, unerring, sure, with devilish art. Possess this body. Seize this heart. Nerve and muscle and brittle bone. Make them all your very own. Save the house, master. Quick! No. Put the no. rubies in the parrot's cage. Uh. And it's alive! Uh. At first, your honor... The tiny doll glared murderously at Philomel, the fortune teller. Even in the candlelight, I could see her grow pale. But the instant the doll saw the jewels, greed crept into its eyes. And nimbly, its tiny sword glittering in the candlelight, it ran across the tabletop, jumped to a shelf, and then, as graceful as a cat, leaped across to the parrot's cage. For a moment he hung there, the cage swinging back and forth, silently, back and forth. The parrot shouted at him, but the doll showed no signs of fear. He stared coldly, and with a thin, amused smile at the bird behind the bars. What happened then, Your Honor, happened in a twinkling. The doll flung the cage door back, and in he leaped, his sword flashing with a rapier speed. The parrot's wings frantically beat the air, and it screamed. Blood peered upon the bird's breast. The doll, like an Italian fencing master, danced about the frenzied bird, plunging his sword into it time and time again. All of us stood there, staring, open-mouthed, at the struggle in the cage, unaware that it was only the parrot screaming. 
It seemed to each of us that we could hear the din of some titanic battle, that we could see the dust of some distant armies locked in war. And then it was over in a flash. The bird screamed. It shuddered and spasms racked its body. And then it fell to the floor of the cage. For a moment the doll stood there, wild-eyed and panting. And then it bent, scooped up the rubies and swung out of the cage. When it reached us, it dropped the jewels on the tabletop and watched Philomel. Magnificent! Magnificent! Did you see him? Lord! My doll's a success! A success! Philomel! Watch out! Hippie! Hippie! I've got him! Draw the soul out, quick! quick. Did you see? He lunged at her! The doll lunged at Philomel! Draw out the soul! Draw out the soul! Relax the muscle! Release the bone! Give up this palace! Leave this home! The uh, doll lunged at Philomel the fortune uh, teller? Yes, Your Honor. The doll had lunged at Philomel the fortune teller. There was no question about it. The doll, or the soul that was in it, considered Philomel as his foe. At that time, Your Honor, the sword in the doll's hand was not poisoned. Ah, but later on, yes, later on... Be quiet. Must I clear it? Now you may go on, Mr. Hippie. Continue with your confession regarding the murder of the fortune teller, Philomel. When we were done there in the bird shop, and we'd drawn the soul out of the doll in time to save Philomel, we separated. I took my doll, now stiff and wooden, back to my shop, placed it on a shelf, and began walking upstairs to bed. I didn't hear the voices until after I'd reached the first land. He left you here like this in the dark? He always leaves me like this, Solon. I sit for hours in darkness. I cannot open the window. He nailed it shut. I watched from the street many times, hoping you'd come to it. I couldn't. I know why now. What shall I do, Solon? My life here is a misery. He beats me, treats me like a slave and hates me. Come away with me, Zonila. With you? Yes. Listen to me, Zonila. All that has been said between us are the words in books I've read to you. They were meant for others, those words. But when I said them, I knew. I felt that they were mine. What are books to me, Zanila, but sources to find my thoughts of you in words? Sola. Don't look at me with such wonder and surprise in your eyes, Zanila. Is it a wonder that I should love you? Is it an incredible event that your name should ring like a joyous bell in my brain? For months I've watched your window, hoping to see you appear in it. For months, torturous days, I've loved you, Zanila. Loved you. And spoke to you the words of others because I was afraid. You love me, Solon? Me, a poor wretch? No poor wretch to me, Zanila. But the reality of my dream, the personification of my hopes. Me? Me? My love's as wide as the ocean's wide, Zanila, and as deep, and as strong and firm as the Iron Mountains. Solon? Yes? It's so hard to say. So hard. Say it, Zanila. Say it. Dear Solon. You cry. <laughs> because a miracle has happened. A miracle. Zanila. I've loved you from the first time I heard your voice. And I thought you were only kind, showing pity. And I needed even that. I never thought you'd love me in my misery. Zanila, come away with me. Something is happening here in this house. It's evil. I felt it. You must come away with me. Wherever you want to go, Solon. Will you come now? Yes. Father. Oh, and where will you take her? Mr. Hip. In what volume is this chapter, Bookworm? Is the escape all planned out for you by some other writer? I don't need their help. Yet you use them to steal her affection from me. Affection? What affection? From her father's loving bosom, you would steal her. His light of life. Leave us alone. I'm the brute, eh? The beast who treads on delicate feelings, is that it? We're leaving her together. Without my blessing? Without your curse. Come, Zonila. Stop. Leave the girl alone, Cockerel, or I shall smash you even more than I plan. Do you think, fool, that I shall let her go? After all these years of crossing me, taunting me... You think I shan't have my vengeance? Zola, Zola! Cry to your miserable lover. Get out of the doorway. I have plans for you, Zonila. 
You shall play nursemaid and mother to a doll I've fashioned. A more murderous child you'll never have. It's a gift I've carved for you to amuse you when you're lonely or to haunt your dreams. And I've a name for that doll, a fine name, one which will dry your tears when the real owner of it is no more. It shall be called Solan. Get away from the door. The comedy is over now, Bookworm. Solan, he's coming towards you. That's an alert girl you'll never wed, Bookworm. Come here. Don't, Solan, don't. Ah. Ah. No, Cockerel, we'll test you. Solan! 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 Quiet! You may proceed. I had to strike the girl to quiet her, Your Honor. And when she was still, I bound up Solon, slung him across my shoulder like a sack of meal, and carried him downstairs to the shop. A plan was already formed in my mind, but it needed the help of the fortune teller, Philomel. I made sure the shop was locked, and leaving Solon there lying on the floor, I went out. The hour was 9.30. It took me only a few minutes to reach the fortune teller's door. Who is it? Open. It's I, Hippie the Wondersmith. Coming. I'm an old woman. You knock like the very devil's behind you. Come in. Uh, what brings you here now? The dull soul. I need it. Ah, uh, and why? I have a task for him. Another test, and it must be done tonight. What test, Wondersmith? A human one. So long, the bookworm. <laughs> Will you bring the soul? No. What? Why? Why not? I am not anxious to be carved like roast pork wonder smith by the little devil. He hates me. We were badly met, it seems. But I need the soul now. No. I'll give you half my share of what the doll brings us later. And if I've long been buried by then? Philomel. No. Hippie, I must trap another soul. I won't wait. I won't. Solon must die now. Hippie! But I wasn't leaving as early as that, Your Honor. Outside the fortune teller's door, I waited. And when I heard her creak out of the room, I stole in. I knew where she kept the bottled soul. I found it, slipped it in the pocket, and stole out down to my workshop again. Solon was awake now. And as I came in, he watched me. I was pleased that he would be aware of what was going to occur. Who is it? Who's there? Awake, bookworm. Good. You shall be my audience. Look. Do you see this bottle? Answer. I listen. Let me go, hippie. Soon. Soon. You shan't be in this world much longer. This bottle. Let Zonila go then, if not me. It's Zonila I want. It's you I have no use for, bookworm. Look. There's a soul trapped in this bottle that fits a tight one. Listen how he stares. Hippie. What? What do you want? I'll give you anything. The riches of books, the wealth of fool's wisdom. Have you any gold? No, but... Then we will you... go on. I have a doll bookworm. Let me show you why I am called the Wondersmith. Look, isn't he a very devil of a fellow? Oh. And the sword, it's sharp. Small, but life, they say, hangs only by a thin thread. Yet, to make sure, Bookworm, I shall poison the sword. You're mad, hippie. Mad or not, I shall kill you. There. The sword's primed. Now watch me. Oh. I, too, can create life. I shall cover the doll. Now, if you please, I shall place this diamond ring upon your chest. My doll needs an incentive. No, no. No, don't move. Have you pity? Pity is a disease of fools. I've done without it. But no man... Stop. Take your ethics to the grave with you. Now, the moment's ready. Watch sharply. I put the bottle beneath the wrapping. Loose oh. the stopper and... Spare me. Unerring, sure, with devilish art. Possess this body. Seize this heart. Nerve and muscle and brittle bone. Make them all your very own. Ah, uh, look. It moves. Off with the covering. Off. See how he glares. There's your victim there. Epi, you monster. Philomel. You fool, I... Philomel. The doll. The doll, Philomel. Stop it, Hippie. Stop it. 
I can still see it all clearly, Your Honor. The shop, Solon, the floor, and the look on the doll's face when he caught sight of Philomel. That was the time I first noticed the gold brooch on the front of Philomel's dress. The doll raced across the floor with his sword held high. Philomel's face fell and then grew rigid with terror. She tried to back away, but the doll kept lunging and striking, lunging and striking. And I could see the tiny sword sink in each time. Philomel gasped and shrieked with pain each time the sword struck. Suddenly, the fortune teller tottered, and her great body crashed to the floor. There was a sharp splintering of wood. I saw a tiny sword go skittering across the floor. And then I knew the doll, the doll I had fashioned, Your Honor, had been crushed, and the soul in it freed. I tried to raise Philomel. She was still alive. Oh, I'm sick, Wonder Smith. Sick. The sword. You poisoned it, didn't you? Yes, Philomel. Can you do anything? No. You fool. Fool, I warned you. The doll would have turned on you. Where is he? Crushed. You crushed him. So I gave him his freedom after all. He was an angry soul, stubborn for his freedom. The bookworm? Alive, but not for long. Let him alone, Wonder Smith. Never. You're purchasing a bitter afterlife, as bad as mine will be. <gasps> oh, the pain. The pain. No riches and no power for us, Wonder Smith. We'll go to the grave, penniless like all the others. Light, light, it's getting dark. Philomel. I say, let there be light. <laughs> oh, I am forewarned of the region I shall awake in. Wonder Smith? Yes. You are my executor. You will find neither gold nor jewels, but a crystal which you must destroy. Where are you? Here, Philomel. You will find it in... Oh, oh! A light! Strike a light, someone. Wondersmith. Wondersmith! I must have a light. Philomel. Philomel. Huh? You're leaving so soon, Wondersmith. Well, then. Good night, neighbor. Good night. It was a fine evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. And she was dead, Your Honor. And for a little while, I sat there in the silence, holding her head in my arms. I think, and believe me, Your Honor, it is important that you do. I think I love the fortune teller. In a little while, I got up. The young man was staring at the door. In it, pale, drawn, filled with terror, stood Zonila, a pistol shaking in her hand. I could have taken it from her without danger, Your Honor. But what was the use? Philomel was dead, and I knew it was the end. How can I explain it? The rest you know. How Solon and Zunila brought me to the police. How I was brought to trial. I am here because I am guilty. I beg no mercy from the court. Only, Your Honor, make it soon. Soon. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought you the story, The Doll. Bellkeeper, toll the bell.
Thank you for listening to Theatre of Screams. Join us next week for another chilling compilation. Until then, this is Gideon Bones wishing you pleasant dreams. From the Theatre of Screams. Sit, Ubu, sit. Good cow.